right, hello everyone and welcome. Um, it's a pleasure to have so many of you here. Uh, looking forward to it. Uh, thank you to those that feel comfortable having a camera on. It gives me some uh, first-hand feedback from your uh, facial expressions. So if you feel, feel free to take some funny facial expressions if there's anything that you want to raise. Uh, welcome to a discussion on uh, eco-disabilism. Uh, it's basically gonna give you an introduction to the term, um, its impact on disabled people, and best practice for environmental campaigns. I like everyone to leave any talk that I do with at least one thing they can put in place um, when they start work in the morning or as a student do campaigns uh, in the following week. So the agenda today, um, as Ron said, it's 40 minutes with a little, little Q&A at the end, uh, but I'm gonna introduce you to myself and then there's gonna be a poll. We're gonna be using Slido. So if you've not encountered Slido before, it's a bit like Menti, but it's screen reader friendly. There'll be instructions on screen on how to how to join, but I borrowed the One Planet Week hashtag, so the join code will be OPW21. Um, but other than that, um, we'll be covering Disability 101, um, eco disabilism and the social model, uh, and then give you a, some examples of eco disabilism, the current history, along with some global policy issues that have come out as a result. Um, Bit of a themes discussion at the end uh, and that wonderful little take home uh, point. Additionally, um, all the way throughout, if you do use Slido, if you put it in the chat, you can ask questions. Uh, they come up on the screen at the end uh, if you do submit them via the Slido Q&A section thingy. So um, feel free to do that and I'll try and pick up any of the ones in the chat at the same time. But please bear with me, I only have one screen. <laughs> Fair warning, um, there are content warnings and topics of discussion in this as a nature of the topic itself. There will be talk of eugenics, uh, sterilization, uh, disabilism, as is to a certain extent within the title, but also death. Um, feel free to mute me, feel free to turn your camera off and take a moment outside when we get to those sorts of content. That's absolutely fine. So introductions. Who am I to be giving this talk? Well, uh, first and primarily, I'm the Higher Education Policy and Partnerships Lead at Diversity and Ability. For those that haven't encountered DNA before, we're a disabled-led social enterprise run by disabled people for disabled people. Over 85% of our team um, identify as disabled, and we sort of lead the sector and support disabled students, disabled institutions, uh, disabled staff in institutions, sorry, um, and uh, in the workplace as well. I also was appointed as a student voice commissioner within the Disabled Students Commission that was set up last year. And I've been an inquiry commissioner on a couple of other commissions, uh, most importantly, the Higher Education Commission on Disabled Student Experiences. In my free time, I enjoy being a policy and accessibility consultant. Um, and my main background is in uh, sustainability and disability inclusion, digital accessibility and a couple of other areas. But some of the cool things that I've worked on before is the phase out of plastics bill um, from 2019 that Friends of the Earth and other NGOs co-sponsored, uh, the mental health charter and student accommodation codes. So the students in here will very much know some of my work, even if you didn't know it was me putting those clauses in. And uh, I used to support uh, students organizing for sustainability um, as one of their uh, advisory board uh, individuals. Here's the fun part, which is getting to know my audience. So how, who are you and how, how where, whereabouts do you come from? So are you a student? So feel free to use the QR code or join at slido.com and put in the OPW21 to become a part of this interactive bit. So you can do it on your phone, you can do it on a, a new tab, but feel free to engage. But it should come up with this, this poll for you, which is where do you come from? Are you a student? Are you part of the staff at an institution, whether it's York or otherwise? Um, are you part of the general public? Or are you a disability specialist? Because I know uh, if you follow me on Twitter, you might be a disability specialist. So we've had a couple of responses so far, and as you can see, it's live and it will give you some live responses. So welcome primarily to the students, um, to the general public as well. It's an amazing to have you all here. And uh, it's nice to know that we've got some staff in the room as well. Cool. So here's one for you. Have you heard of eco-disabilism before? So other than the title itself, 
have you come across this 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 topic and th this phrase? Okay, we've got a nice little distribution. About forty to fifty percent have said sort of, unsure. That's good. That's good. It means you, there's something to learn for everyone. Some people have heard of it before, and uh, similarly, same number haven't. Now here's the question. We'll come back to this at the end, and I hopefully the stats will be improved. But how confident do you feel with understanding what eco disabledism is? Some of you have encountered the term before, some of you haven't. Um, so feel free to be as honest as possible. I don't see your answers. Um, and I've kept it coming up on screen uh, just for this one so that people don't feel self-conscious until the final result in answering. But how confident do you feel with understanding what eco disabledism is? Got 18 responses, cool. So, ooh, a little bit is the top result with 56%. We've got fairly confident with 28%. Not at all at 11%, thank you for being honest. Um, and definitively at 6% and mostly at zero. That's a good distribution. I thought most people would be in the middle there with a little bit. So, Disability 101. As everyone has sort of come from different backgrounds, as a student, as staff, but there's very few disability specialists in the room. Um, I thought I'd give everyone a quick introduction as to what disability is, disabledism more generally, and the social model, so you know the background in which we're basing eco-disabledism on. What is disabledism? Disabledism, by definition, is a discrimination or prejudice towards disabled people, often from the belief disabled people are inferior to non-disabled people. That's a very broad definition, but it's a definition that encompasses many of the factors and facets of the types of discrimination or prejudice a disabled person can face. It can refer to um, active prejudices, so that's often where we come into hate crimes, that's where we come into um, active stereotyping and actively engaging with harassment as well. We also have stereotyping. We see this most often in scrounger rhetoric, where disabled people are thought of as burdens, as dependents on the state, as unproductive. Um, and we also have uh, the opposite side of that, which some call potentially positive discrimination, um, which is the term supergrip. For those that haven't encountered this term before, this was often applied during uh, 2012, during the Paralympic Games that were held here in London, where disabled people were put on uh, adverts and TV, which was a great win. But at the same time, the, un the idea of what those people could do, um, you know, the Usain Bolts of the Paralympic world was used to compare to uh, everyday disabled people and uh, hence the term super grip, because uh, that standard of uh, performance and excellence in, in a field of sport was used as a way to stereotype what all disabled people should be um, uh, able to do. Despite the fact that I very doubt many people here who are not disabled uh, are able to run as fast as Usain Bolt. There's also, considering we're talking about a student uh, area, institutional barriers and, and unconscious bias. Uh, and these are things that often get sort of misplaced when it comes to disabledism as they sort of don't feel uh, malicious in any way, but the way in which we set up our society and build our society can have uh, and create barriers for disabled people, whether that's forgetting to put in a lift for a lecture theater for someone that's a wheelchair user or um, making text difficult to read, such as using a white background um, without using buff colouring for someone that would prefer to have a buff background. For those wondering, a buff background is this weird off yellow colour that I'm using for the back of my slides. Um, and that can help with some disabled people in reading and comprehension. Gatekeeping is another one. Um, some, some people don't realize that a lot of disabled people's lives are sort of controlled by external factors um, and even by friends and family as well. So limiting what a disabled person can do, go out, who they can see, what activities they can engage in, um, as well as uh, what, what sort of employment they can get as well. So it's, it's a very large, broad term to uh, highlight the disabledism that a person can face when trying to access things that they should be able to access, but due to other barriers and other factors and attitudes, they are being kept from those opportunities. 
Just going to double check the chat just in case. But uh, as always, uh, feel free to put the Q&A questions in the Slido, but also uh, comments and questions in the chat of the things that are going on. And I'll try and answer them because whilst this is a, a very quick 40 minute introduction to uh, disablism and eco-disablism, uh, obviously not everyone will be coming from the same knowledge background. So feel free to put those in the chat. On to the social model of disability. If I click the screen rather than the chat. So here's another Slido poll for everyone. When was the social model defined? Was it 1895, 1945, 1975 or 1995? And whilst you guys engage with that poll, I'm going to take a drink. This is uh, interesting. So we have 17 respondents so far. Uh, the vast majority of you with 47% said 1975. Quite a few said 1995, 35%. Um, a couple said 1895. I appreciate your enthusiasm and thank you for answering that. Um, and some more said 1945. I chose some of these uh, dates and times because they refer to other parts of history that are quite important for disabled people. However, the correct answer is 1975. Um, those that feel that 1995 was the answer, that was the Disability Discrimination Act, uh, which did incorporate aspects of the social definition, uh, admittedly. 1895 was around about the time, if I remember my history correctly, of certain um, insane asylum acts, uh, which were not helpful for disabled people. And 1945 uh, was, to a certain extent, the revolution that came post-World War II for disabled people based off of the uh, veterans movement. But thank you for answering that. The social model of disability. I like to talk here about the people that coined the phrase um, the social model or social definition, as they said back in their day which was defined in 1975 by the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, UPS. UPS was a fairly new organization in the 1970s that was set up by disabled people uh, who lived primarily in institutions and uh, assisted living centers. One particular important uh, co-founder of UPS and creator of the social definition of disability was uh, Victor. Victor, um, has a really important history for when we talk about eco-disabilism and the way in which the social model of disability was defined because he was imprisoned in South Africa in the 1960s for anti-apartheid uh, activities. Um, apartheid was the segregation laws in South Africa for those that uh, were unaware um, that discriminated against people of color. And he, in his activism, encountered and fought against social activism wise, was actually imprisoned for it. When he was released from prison, he came to the UK um, and used the experiences um, he witnessed during apartheid and the police br brutality of apartheid to redefine oppression of disabled people and came up with the definition that we now know as the social model. And it's important as well uh, with, the, with this talk that we, we mentioned that he did move to the UK as a refugee um, due to his imprisonment and the priest brutality that he faced. He was able to move to the UK um, as a refugee to escape that. So himself and along with others at UPS came up with a short definition of disability that states, disablement lies with the barriers disabled people face within society rather than an individual's impairment. It is a social, uh, is a societal issue and liberated access for disabled people requires society to change. The reason why uh, this was new is because previously was the medical model. I won't get too much into the medical model because this is supposed to be on eco-disabilism. However, this social definition would state that I as a wheelchair user only encounter barriers in society when I haven't been accounted for. So when there's no step free access, when there's no lifts, that is the disabling factor. That is why I'm a classed as a disabled person. 
If everything was step free, those of you that have seen me around in my wheelchair would know that I probably have a significant advantage over you. I can climb flights of chairs in my wheelchair. I can do tricks and flips and was once caught on um, Southampton Pride's video camera doing that sort of thing as well. So it was the it's the barriers that I face as a wheelchair user and uh, that would be the disabling factor under the social model. And this is important because it phrases the barriers that disabled people face as a societal issue and importantly that it's society's responsibility to change to be more inclusive. So here we get on to the topic of today which is what is eco-disabilism? It's difficult to put down into one single definition because it encounters quite a lot of multifaceted aspects and can be uh, defined in various ways depending on the people that are defining it. However, uh, in my work I have defined it broadly as a form of disabilism where sustainability and environmental policies and or ideologies erase or disadvantage disabled people and their voices. This is a, a definition that effectively just contextualizes the previous definition of disabilism for environmental sciences, for the environmental campaigns that we run, um, and particularly highlights the fact that erasure of voice and the um, exclusion of voice is also part of uh, eco-disabilism. So it's not just uh, intentional exclusion or unconscious biases, but it's the active suppression of voice that is included in that. It's also important to note that eco-disabilism has uh, links with eugenics, white supremacy and racism. We'll get more on that um, a little bit later. But that anti-racism and anti-disabilism are both essential parts of eco-disabilism. You can't have one without the other. But all of it relies upon the devaluing of lives, but also the codifying the price of a life. So putting a monetary value or an ecological impact value on a life so that some can be valued as more or less important than others, and therefore their voices or um, impact can be, can be uh, identified or weighed against others. But it also relies upon a concept of expendability, which is qu it's become quite more common in our society at the moment, where particularly with the COVID, pandemic where hence why we're doing this not in person where expendability has become quite an important aspect of uh, how policies and societal attitudes shape the responses to humanitarian crises um, as we've seen with the covid pandemic which is a humanitarian crisis uh, different countries have different policies and that is why as part of this talk i'll give some examples of that uh, at a later stage but fundamentally, it's a separation of liberation from environmentalism is what eco disabilism comes down to. It's the siloing of those two aspects as separate and non-intersecting or in interconnecting philosophies, ideologies or campaigns. And hopefully everyone here understands that that's not quite true. So as part of this talk, I think it's quite important to go over some of the examples of eco disabilism so that everyone here gets a, an understanding of exactly what I am meaning and what I'm talking about within a, a real life case example context. But before I do that, I want to know from an audience, 50% of you said that you sort of have a grasp of this. So what examples have you previously experienced or encountered? There was a, a giveaway in the, in the text description of this event. So feel free to put that one if you like. Uh, but as some of you here may be disabled or have worked in this field for a while, feel free to post uh, a response here. I think they're open text comments um, and it should come up. There we go. We've got one already, the plastic straw ban, plastic straw ban um, of previous eco-disabilism issues that you may have encountered. I, I, I quite like doing this because it allows me to uh, sometimes be brought up to some new issues that I might have missed. Uh, particularly local community issues. A uh, restaurant wouldn't give me a straw. I ended up dropping the glass and it shattered. Zero plastic drives, affordable disposable bags. Quite a big focus on plastic straws and plastics, which is good because I have that as an example, uh, which works for me. 
and uh, helps everyone. DNRs during the pandemic, an excellent uh, point from whoever submitted that. That is a particular topic that I'm working on as of th this week uh, in my other roles that I hold and was working on during the first and second wave as well. Um, but that is a nice contextual experience or encounter and street lighting, yes. Dietary requirements, awesome. Thank you for those captioning and lectures. Interesting. Uh, I actually, if you stick stick around to the end, I have a slide for you on uh, what other things that you can engage in regarding lectures and those sorts of things. Benches not being used, vegans being nasty. I suppose the issue of anonymized submissions has that you can be sarcastic about vegans. Uh, printing and paper use. But vegan attitude is an additional thing, but I wouldn't apply it to all vegans, um, just some that are quite vocal, I suppose, is the correct answer. Mask exemption system in shops and transport. Very, very good. That's a better answer than I've had um, from this group. Um, so you should all be proud of yourselves because usually I get plastic straw and cutlery um, are the two, two, two ones that I usually get. So we have a switched on group. Thank you. Um, someone here, I think uh, I saw his face actually designed this. So if you see Steve in the participants, uh, give him a shout because he designed this for me at my request, which is Straw Wars because I'm a Star Wars fan. Um, and for those that uh, may not be able to see the image clearly, it is the Star Wars logo stylized um, into the word Straw Wars. And below that are two silhouetted wheelchair users fighting with the stereotype cartoon paper straw. Fundamentally, this is a single use plastics situation where plastic pollution is an important issue. As a, someone that studied an MSI in physical oceanography, I can attest to you that plastic pollution is an important issue. I've modeled, it, modeled its distribution in currents before. However, the majority of plastic pollution is unnecessary. We know this, there's very little scientific evidence that says that the that plastic pollution is something that we can't fight. And it's something that we must do just as part of our social responsibility to address the impact that we have had. The question that I posit, and I have not answered yet, and I don't think I will answer because it is a, a philosophical one, but do we have an equal responsibility to reduce plastic pollution? Some of the comments and campaigns that have been uh, quite viral have been based upon this assumption that we all have an equal responsibility to reduce plastic pollution. And I would like that question to be in your thoughts as we go through the next couple of slides and in particularly the global policy impacts. Just a second, I'm just gonna take a quick drink. There we go. Some of you may have seen this image on the right hand side. This image was uh, all over Twitter. It was featured in a Jessica Cullen Forsgaard video, I think as well. It is a table that highlights what many, 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 many disabled people have said many, many, many times, which is fundamentally about what is and isn't suitable for them as a disabled person. Now, for those that haven't encountered this before, that may not know that straws were first invented, flexible plastic straws were first invented in the 1940s to replace glass straws used in hospitals due to position ability and removal of breakage risks. Unsurprisingly, having a glass straw um, poses a risk for having some glass in your mouth if you have a bite reflex, if you have spasms, or if you're just clumsy like myself or all of the above. It's also important to note that the National Union of Students, which I was an officer of up until uh, last year, uh, actually ran a campaign uh, calling for the ban of straws uh, called the Last Straw Campaign that failed to take into account the information on the right hand side in that table. And as a result of that, there has been significant uptake in society of the plastic straw banning uh, movement to the point where we are now today, where plastic straws are, and a lot of other single-use plastics are banned in, in most situations. However, single-use plastics are overwhelmingly 
not straws, stirrers and stems. Uh, the Great Garbage Patch um, by weight tonnage is significantly fishing equipment. And in terms of the UK's output of plastic, it's around about 0.003% per weight tonnage of plastic. So in terms of per weight tonnage, straws, stirrers and stems are not a significant um, aspect of our single use plastic pollution, uh, even though they may have contextual specific issues with certain marine life. Similarly with uh, the old uh, beer can rings used to have a specific impact that they did have. But the, the main point here is that that table on the right hand side had to be produced because disabled voices and autonomy was erased. Uh, and during the, the campaigns, during the, the eventual uh, parliamentary debate um, that did sort of occur, um, these things had to be brought up time and time again to the point that someone had to produce a snazzy graphic that we see on the right hand side where people had to highlight that a disabled person is the person who knows what their needs are. But importantly for anyone that is like me and has read the Equality Act into depth, uh, it shifts the cost of plastic uh, of a straw predominantly onto the disabled person because they will have to have a straw such as the silicone ones or a biodegradable non single use one if a restaurant or cafe no longer provides them. And for anyone that has read the quality set like I did in depth will know that you cannot shift costs of an adjustment onto the disabled person themselves. It's just not allowed and yet this is seemingly passed notice in a lot of institutions and a lot of restaurants and is part of the the main reason why this has been difficult to challenge because it takes an individual disabled person facing an individual discriminatory action to take it to court to get a legal challenge uh, to be successful in changing governmental and society-wide policy, which is very, very difficult for those that have encountered talks that I've done before. I did just wanna cover two other aspects of plastic pollution that do come up quite frequently and were both part of viral Twitter trends. The first image on the left-hand side is a photo taken at Whole Foods showing pineapple chunks in tiny little plastic pots stacked up on each stacked on top of each other uh, on a shelf. And there's text above it that reads, gosh, Whole Foods, if only pineapples had a natural container that, dot, dot, dot. Oh, that's not silly either, question mark. Oranges are okay. Now, whilst that isn't comprehensibly a, a good sentence uh, in terms of the English language, I will say that the uh, vilification of pre-cut produce is something that has become much more common when we've been talking about plastic pollution. And similarly on the right hand side it's a, it's a photo of a ready meal. I don't know exactly what type of ready meal, it's just a bog standard black tray with food inside. And what many people um, don't realise is that whilst ready meals are meant to be quick and easy, they are sometimes the only source of nutrition that a disabled person can access because of the way in which our housing situation is in the UK. For those that don't know, only 0.5% of housing in the UK is adapted or accessible for disabled people. Population wise, it's about 20% of the population is disabled. So we're all trying to access uh, accessible services and kitchens that may not just be there and you might only have a microwave to cook your food. Ready meals were originally intended for disabled people before they were mass marketed, and they still serve an essential function in society. But the common themes of this is that consumerism is the focus here. Throughout all of this, it's about the, the laziness or the, the, the frivolity of having these items in, in, in the containers that they are in. And the focus has been on the person buying these products rather than on the producer of the single use plastics. So the person that produced the container for Whole Foods for a perishable good decided to use a material that will last thousands of years. And similarly with the microwavable container, they've also chosen to use a product uh, to contain their ready meal that will only last maybe three months on the shelf with a plastic that will last thousands if not tens of thousands of years before biodegrading, if at all it does. And the container itself may be a single use plastic, but the user is the one that is targeted with the stigmas, as I've mentioned. And it's the stigmatization of readily accessible foods. It shifts the blame from the producer to the disabled person primarily, and shifts the blame away from the main cause and the main person responsible. I'll harken back to the question I mentioned earlier. Are we equally responsible? 
to a disabled person that may not have an alternative means to access food. Um, particularly within the last couple of months, disabled students have been encountering issues accessing food banks because uh, if you're shielding, you can't go to a food bank, but food banks don't deliver. So even when you can access more readily available foods, fresh produce, there are systems in place that make it very difficult to access if you are a disabled person. And many of the viral moments that I've mentioned and were found on Twitter and platforms like it were actually co-opted by multinational companies to direct attention away from their production practices. Um, I'm not going to mention any company names in particular, uh, just for liability reasons, but I'm sure you can uh, think of a couple of national multinationals that have a vested interest in focusing on the consumer rather than their bottling practices or their production practices. But importantly, the most common theme is it dictates to disabled people what we need and what we don't need. It is uh, once again, a common theme of voice erasure, but also the energy required by a disabled person to once they are challenged is continually having to explain yourself with easily searchable information. So anyone here right now could uh, jump onto Google, type in single use plastics disabled people, and you'd find hundreds of articles written by disabled people about this particular issue. And I'll leave it up to them to describe their own lived experiences in there. Yes, but it's something I recommend doing. If you're wondering about disabled people, a quick Google can often save uh, everyone a bunch of time and a disabled person having to repeat themselves for the thousandth time that year. But importantly, uh, eco-disabilism isn't a silo, as I've mentioned before. Part of the factors around eco-disabilism is this idea that came from uh, an unfortunate book from uh, about 40, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, I forget exactly when it was published. I think it was 1940s, 1950s, uh, called The Population Bomb. Um, and it devised uh, a overpopulation as being the root cause of environmental issues. Uh, and unfortunately, that's a relic of eugenicist beliefs, which we'll get onto in a little while. But even the author was even uh, last year and the year before, I believe actually 2019, um, stated that it, the aim of the book was to make population control acceptable as a topic of debate. And he was very successful in that. But unfortunately, overpopulation focuses on ecology and population rather than the economics and sociology of uh, the environmental impact that we have. Overpopulation is the idea that there are too many humans on the planet consuming, and it bases off the assumption that we aren't ever going to change our consumer practices and that we all have consumer practices that are exactly the same. And we know that's not true. Uh, the poorest half of the population consume 10%, whereas top 10% produce 50% of pollution. So it really isn't a balanced issue there. So once again, I refer you back to my previous question. Are we all equally responsible? Uh, as it says at the top of the side, sterilization and stigma. This is the content warning. If you don't want to hear topics of death, eugenics, and uh, references to the Holocaust, feel free to meet me right now and come back in about five minutes. However, population and overpopulation is a common political response initiative to ideologies around population control. There's quite a few well-known examples. Some of you may have heard of China's one child policy. Some of you may have heard of the COVID immune, herd immunity policy. And they all around population control, but many don't realize is actually the eugenics policies of uh, today and the last half century came from UK and US sterilization programs. The US sterilization program in Puerto Rico resulted by the 1970s in a third of all female um, Puerto Ricans being uh, sterilized. And in the UK, we still have policies that um, enable um, people with learning uh, disabilities to be sterilized or their children to be um, or to be forced to have abortions against their own uh, choice and will. There's a quite a big um, news where they case only a few years ago. Additionally, for those that don't know, um, Action T4 was the program that was the precursor to the Holocaust and was based off of the UK and US sterilization programs that our society is built off of to today regarding uh, some overpopulation and uh, initiatives to population control responses regarding uh, stigma and sterilization. 
these policies and ideas are inherently predisposed to rely upon common attitudes that build upon disabilism, racism, and misogyny. Puerto Rican Latinos were targeted as part of racism and misogyny. Um, and as part of Action T4, of course, it was disabled people that were targeted then. But these issues, whilst we have banned um, almost globally now for sterilization without court orders, there are still issues around parental white rights, weaponization of disability in the abortion debate, and fundamentally it's all built upon the removal of body autonomy and voice erasure. As I keep mentioning, there's a common theme throughout all of this, which is body autonomy and voice erasure. We're on to the final section now, which is disproportionate impact. And I like to talk about this because uh, this is, this is my main area of expertise, but it's quite boring for a lot of people and I was warned against focusing on it too much. So back to Slido, if you don't mind, um, as we come close to finishing. When was disabled people inclusion formally adopted into the UNHRC's disaster response policy? So now we're going on to disaster response. And we've had some responses so far. Quite a few people believe 2019. There's 2001, 2014, 2008, and 1995. Getting a very even spread. Uh, thank you for those that picked up on 1995 being once again the DDA. I shouldn't have given that away earlier. But it's interesting. It's roughly even, I would say, with uh, quite a few of you. The correct answer there is 2019. So, that is what I like to call my shock and awe tactic, because global policy issues are about this fact. It was only two years ago, I keep forgetting it's 2021, apologies, but it was only two years ago that the United Nations Human Rights Council formally adopted a policy saying that disabled people should be included in disaster relief response, which was only actually brought up, it's at the bottom, but I should have put it above, but it was actually only brought up in 2015 as an issue of a policy issue in 2015. And it still took four years to fully adopt and implement. So whilst there's a lot of vocal action and saying, yes, no, we definitely agree. The implementation into an overseeing body an influencing and lobby bo lobbying body uh, only adopted it in 2019 and obviously that's not been long enough for it to be adopted into countries themselves, because bear in mind the UN is a membership organization where people can voluntarily take on aspects of those laws and policies. But fundamentally, globally, disabled people are disproportionately impacted by environmentalism, by environmental disasters. First and foremost, we're significantly more likely to be in poverty in the world, disabled people of color more so. We have limited access to resources. As I've mentioned, even in this country, we have limited access, particularly during humanitarian crises, but also causality. Humanitarian crises create disabled people. You can acquire a disability at any point in your life. And as part of Hurricane Katrina, as part of the forest fires in, the, in Australia, as part of the flooding in um, Bangladesh and other countries around the world, disabled people uh, were created as a result of those global disasters. And unfortunately, disaster response policies um, recommend abandonment of disabled family members, um, often require centralized res relief response where you will have um, within the center of a city, you'll have hubs of relief response where people have to go to access food, clean water, tents, and be distributed resources. Now, if you're a disabled person who struggled to access resources in a non-disaster center bef uh, before a disaster hits, such as public transport issues, such as roads, pavements, physical access issues, uh, personal assistance support, in the event of a disaster, those avenues are even made even worse. So you have even limited action to, uh, if you survive abandonment, to then access centralized relief. And on top of that, there are many, many laws across the world, including in the UK, where immigration has medical exemptions, where if you are considered a burden on the NHS, you are not allowed into the country. You are given a medical exemption and refused. This includes student visas, so it is a student issue as well. But also as a climate refugee, if you're a disabled climate refugee, which 
disproportionately more likely because you're fleeing a climate disaster or a war disaster, you are likely to have a disability of some kind, primarily mental health. There are medical exemptions to your staying here, which means that you can't get secondary care. Secondary care is things like social care, it's things like outpatient care. So there's many, many reasons why there's global policy issues regarding eco-disablism. It's built off of this idea of being a burden on society, of being not um, valued highly enough, of abandonment, and of policies just not considering us until very recently. And finally, I just want to say, well, this is all doom and gloom-ish, I do have a bit that's about how to fix things. We disabled people have a fundamentally vested interest in environmentalism because we are disproportionately impacted by a lot of aspects, which means that we are very, very wanting to fight uh, environmental disasters and fight climate change because it's based on our survival as well. It's not all doom and gloom, I promise you. This, uh, some people have seen before, this is what I like to call the stair system because I'm a very bad wheelchair user and I love to come up with acronyms that start with stair. But fundamentally, it's a way of working through environmental actions, environmental policies, any of the work you do in your day to day, which is about understanding the fact that we don't know it all. It's about saying, what is the situation that we want to fight? So for me, that was plastic pollution back in 2017, 2018. I said, I really want to fight plastic pollution as a disabled person, as a consultant, what can I do? The target, who is responsible for plastic pollution? Private companies, maybe Nestle, Coke, but really for me, I chose my target was government. If the government legislated, then in this country, they would have to comply. I said, what action will I do? Well, I could lobby government, I could create a bill, I could work with NGOs. So I chose an action. In this case, it was working with Friends of the Earth. And I said, well, what impact would banning all single-use plastics have? And I used my personal knowledge of disabled experiences about straws, the, and I contacted the NHS as well. I got a couple of doctors on board and said, if I got rid of all your single-use plastics, what would happen? And I went, well, we'd have a hygiene nightmare. A lot of our hygiene and sanitation protocols require single-use plastics because they aren't porous. So as part of that, we sat down and thought, what will be the impact of doing these things? And can we mitigate them whilst doing the same action? If not, let's change the action, go back a step, change the action, do another impact. If you're a public institution and you are operating as a public institution with these sorts of campaigns, you are required to do an equality impact assessment, but it's effectively the same thing that you can incorporate into your day-to-day -day activities. And finally, and this is the thing that everyone forgets, review. As part of your campaign, as part of your action, as part of your institution, you need to work out, were you successful in campaigning? Were you, were you able to achieve the action and result that you wanted? If not, Go back, did you have the right situation? Did you have the right target? Did you pick the right target or action is incredibly important to success, but it's also incredibly important that you review whether or not you missed anyone in your impact assessment. We're humans, we're fallible, it's entirely possible. The important aspect here is to do what the UNHRC uh, did, admittedly a little bit late in my personal opinion, and recognize that you've missed people, accept it, engage with those groups and change the way in which you do impact assessments in, in future. And this can fundamentally change how you design campaigns, how you design course modules, how you design calls for action, how you design your interaction with lobbying groups and social activist groups. Because you're building inclusion from the ground up rather than, oh no, we've annoyed someone, was going to use a word there but I can't. Uh, we've annoyed someone, how do we engage them? And you're already at a bad communication point. If you include them at the start in the design process, in the planning process, not only are you hopefully mitigating impacts on them that would be adverse, but you often get better ideas such as being a wheelchair user and sitting in the doorway of a politician because you want them to listen to you. Now final poll, I promise. I think I've gone a little bit over time, but it should be all good. How confident do you now feel with understanding what eco-disablism is? I 
I have to say I'm a little bit proud because at the start, a lot of you were a little bit. Um, and now we have none that are no, not at all. We have none that are a little bit with 53% uh, saying mostly, 32% saying definitely, and 16% saying fairly. We're getting onto the Q&A bit. So if you tick to the fairly box, please make sure you are putting some questions in so we can help you get up to those definitely's and mostly's. Just before you do that, we do have a few content warnings for the questions. Uh, okay, okay. Um, we've there'll be a final slide um, that will show when these this last question is done. By the way, cool. uh, and this oh sorry, it's the second to last poll. I lied. My apologies. Don't trust me. Um, how confident do you feel on being able to implement inclusive practices in your work? This is mainly uh, aimed at the twenty five percent that said they were staff. Hello, um, but also students. Um, in your group work, in your activism work, in your society work. And that's a wonderful sight to see that everyone is a little bit fairly mostly. If you go away and one of you takes away from this, that stare uh, process or makes things a little bit better with inclusivity within your uh, environmental activism and your environmental courses, um, IES courses, etc., I will be a very happy person. And this is the, the Q&A aspect. So uh, Rowan, go ahead. Uh, it's just a possible content warning for um, abortion surrounding disability. Um, well, I don't believe we have any questions in the chat. So I think passing over to Piers for the questions. Awesome. So talking about the straw ban, isn't exemptions enough? It's an interesting point. When we talk about uh, exemptions, no, uh, for two reasons. One, it doesn't change the status quo. One of the aspects of the bill that I uh, helped write some clauses into for Friends of the Earth um, and with additional other aspects is that we also need to include a requirement to do research. We need to make sure that researching bodies are investigating alongside disabled people or even have disabled researchers, is my preference, uh, engaging in ways to make reliance on plastic non-essential anymore. The issue is we don't have that at the moment. We have a requirement where a, a disabled person is, is required by an equality law or required by a law to request something. And the reason why exemptions um, can be counterintuitive is the fact that it requires disclosure and as I mentioned at the start gatekeeping is a big big challenge for a lot of disabled people. It's the idea of uh, one of those things at the moment as to why exemptions can often be um, a double-edged sword is the COVID exemptions are wearing masks at the moment. They are a very good example, a live example of why sometimes exemptions rely on a, an understanding in, from the general public and from the rest of society um that is just not quite there yet one in three people still believe disabled people to be less productive than everyone else so there's attitudinal issues in society that mean we have to fix and we have to address and it's part of what i do in my job at dna um and at that point i believe exemptions will be enough but at the moment not quite do you have examples environmental charity campaigns that engage disabled people when their main purpose has a physical access barrier, e.g. rivers? Uh, that's an interesting question. You may have come to a talk before because I did lose a wheelchair in a salt marsh. Um, for those that uh, wanted to know that. Um, yes and no. So I, uh, having worked with uh, so students organising for sustainability and Friends of the Earth and People and Planet, they have in the last half decade or so really developed their engagement with disabled people and disabled experts in working out what they can and can't um, adapt in some of their, 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 their the, the actions that they do. I think that some of the environmental charity campaigns that focus on uh, physical activities are missing a big bonus of having disabled people engage, uh, which is similar in the way in which protests used to work back in uh, 2015, 2016, when I used to organize those as part of NUS, which is that other than the, the physical access issues themselves, there are other aspects to environmental campaigning 
that these charities can run that help those physical challenges as well. So for example, you can be running Social Media HQ, where the people out there in the cold, whilst you're sat inside with a nice hot chocolate, send you photos about what they're doing and you support the work that they're doing online. There's additional things of uh, supporting those charities and campaigning local authorities to invest in um, accessible access to beaches and things like that, where they do litter picking and those sorts of uh, environmental uh, campaigns. But uh, fundamentally, there is a, 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 a discussion to be had, and I don't think this is the current time to get into it too much, but I'm happy to, um, at a later point, feel free to hit me up on Twitter or something. Uh, about the difference or you know the the positives and gains of making a physical space like a river accessible for a wheelchair user for example or for someone um, that needs extra support in that way um, without damaging the river because that's fundamentally why we're there we don't want to accidentally damage the river in a way that makes it accessible like putting a boardwalk in in terms of physical barriers that are non-mobility related, so energy related and those sorts of things. Fundamentally, there's some out there, I can't name them off by heart, um, but I know that People and Planet and uh, Friends of the Earth engage with this, where they really do uh, support their activists and their volunteers with taking breaks, with ensuring that they only do what they, they feel comfortable doing. Um, and ensuring that people only put enough time in that they can reasonably put in, particularly when they're doing uh, physically demanding activities or uh, activities that can be draining and tiring. As someone that often requires naps throughout the day, um, and having worked with them, they are very accommodating. So I recommend those ones, but they are NGOs rather than charities. What do you think about the recent news surrounding abortions when a baby has a genetic disability? I'm very torn on how to think. Uh, fundamentally, if the abortion, uh, sorry, not if the abortion, but if the baby is viable, then you shouldn't have abortion based on the fact they have a disability. Uh, by definition, you're choosing to abort the baby, in my professional opinion, based on the disability rather than the quality of life or other aspects. Fundamentally, at the heart of a lot of these debates is the idea that a disabled person has a lower quality of life in society than a non-disabled person, and that's only because society isn't accessible. If society was discrimination-free, prejudice-free, and fully inclusive, fully funded, um, and our quality of life as disabled people was the same as uh, non-disabled people, it wouldn't be such a hot topic regarding disability and abortions in that regard because quality of life wouldn't come into the conversation. I additionally work within digital accessibility and assistive technology. And one of the big proponents of the, this sort of debate is people that have social communicative barriers or a learning disability um, saying, you know, they wouldn't be able to access all of society. And that's not quite true when given dedicated support and inclusion, uh, particularly assistive technology, free assistive technology and free support and training. And given that one-to-one -one support that disabled people like myself have in a slightly different fashion, we can engage in society similarly. There's quite a few disabled gamers on Twitch who um, have augmentative alternative communication requirements and they're absolutely fantastic. And they beat me up in all of the fighting games quite routinely. So in regards to that debate, I think fundamentally, if the decision is based on the fact that they're disabled, then that is by definition targeting the baby due to a disability rather than um, being able to be a, alive, as it were, you know, being able to be born alive. I hope that answers that question, which is a very difficult topic. But as I said, um, I'm very much a fan of having these topics, having these discussions, particularly as someone who's worked in this field for a little while now. And this is an interesting question. I'm not sure how much of disabledism, specifically eco-disabledism, would animal rights activists, supposedly assistance dogs, be another example. That's a perfect example. Um, thank you for writing that in. Uh, as long as the assistance dog is not being mistreated and they legally can't be, 
there's so much uh, red tape when it comes to getting an assistance animal. As someone that wanted one, you have to be in a stable home for at least two years and your home is audited and how you treat the animals audited. So trust me, assistance dogs are usually treated better than a lot of children are by their by, by adults. Um, as I think animal rights activists opposing assistance dogs don't understand how assistance dogs work. The, the fact is a disabled person relies on that animal. So if that animal doesn't want to be there, there's very little that that disabled person can do because that they are reliant on that animal in terms of that animal being cooperative. So it's a great example. Um, it, it's sort of to do with eco-disabilism because it's environmentalism and uh, animal welfare rights. But that is a, that's an interesting conversation, I think. And my opinions have been widely known on social media. So feel free to engage with those as well if, uh, if that didn't answer your question. Uh, continued use of single-use plastics. How do we account for microplastics which have been linked to concerns or human health? Do we need system change? I, yeah, as an oceanographer, yeah, we need systemic change. We also need to come up with ways to get plastic out of the ocean. Um, there are parts of the ocean that we have yet to even discover and map properly. Um, and, and microplastics are still there. You know, we're discovering new areas where we're like, oh, no one's ever been here before. And then we find microplastics in the sample. and it's disheartening as an oceanographer to, to have to have to, to, to know that. I think the, the fundamental aspect of microplastics comes down to what produces microplastics rather than just the big plastics, rubber tires, etc., and the way in which we operate in a society that relies on plastic. And that systemic change, in my opinion, has to be legislative. All of a sudden, when things were banned in this country regarding certain single-use plastics overnight, almost those were gone and people found other ways to operate. Similarly, when we come up with limits on plastic packaging, uh, legislatively, those are adopted almost wholesale. Uh, and I, I have a very big bone to pick when it comes to the way in which we talk about consumerism and the, the, the power that we have which is to say the majority of plastic packaging isn't what you buy in a supermarket. The vast majority of it is in transit, in the warehouse, in a superstore, behind the scenes that we never see. So even if we ethically choose things that are not wrapped in plastic, they may have been packaged in plastic whilst they were in transit. Or my favorite are certain supermarkets selling paper straws in plastic packaging. Yeah. That did it. Are there any additional things members of the general public can do to challenge eco disabledism? Fundamentally, yes. Call it out, please. If you see someone challenging a disabled person or someone or, or another aspect of someone's existence as a disabled person, calling it out and being an ally is fundamentally a great thing. Linking things that are easily Googleable on social media is another one because disabled people are very tired. Um, ask anyone about the plastic straw debate um, and it's incredibly tiring to constantly have that conversation over and over again. Link them the Jess Jessica Cullen Forsgaard video because it's better than I can sum up. Um, but also engage with your local parliamentarians, with your local authority, the people that have legislative and political power in your community to make those publicly supported changes such as making it so that supermarkets have to only produce a certain amount of by waste plastic packaging or transporting within your area if you have those powers for example if you live in wales scotland or northern ireland um, if you're in england it's a little bit harder because we have to rely on westminster um, engage with your mp um, engage with your local campaigns and as a member of the general public when you engage with campaigns you have a lot more power than you realize if you say as a member of the public i'd love to support this campaign but you didn't really include disabled people did you that does a lot more to support us than a disabled person saying you didn't include me unfortunately uh Piers, sorry you missed a question Ooh. At the t um but that might be better we have resources um if that helps uh, is that in the chat? Uh, no, that's, do you have a recommendation where to go for information on making comms about sustainability 
e.g. making them inclusive but also accessible oh yeah sorry my apologies um yes um when i get off of the full screen i can find some for you um but lexdisc.org l-e-x luma echo xylophone delta indo go sierra.org.uk um they have uh, and i supported their work they have accessibility and digital accessibility guide regarding communications regarding uh, alt text regarding content production regarding powerpoints literally everything digitally accessible you can think of language based resources there we go thank you um and i was one of the the, the, the disabled voices as part of that group um, additionally, um, DNA ourselves, um, in terms of other than just having a resource guide, we also deliver one to one training and workshops where we teach staff in comms departments how to effectively not only produce content accessibly, but how to engage audiences, particularly disabled audiences, with the right language um, and adopting inclusive practices in a way that is sustainably independent. So you don't need to constantly refer to us in a year's time or two years time, but that you incorporate it into your design process, into your comms process, so that it's done intuitively rather than reactively. Um, for example, I now intuitively describe images on the screen because as someone that used to or still relies on a screen reader, it became very apparent that even though my screen reader couldn't read it, I'd forgotten to read out what I was seeing on screen as well. So there's both free resources, public resources with Lexdisc, but there's also one-to-one -one or Teams, not Microsoft Teams, but comms team stuff as an institution, if you work in an institution that these people up here are absolutely fantastic about. Um, and, you know, just, just as an additional thing, they're absolutely fantastic as well, because it's disabled people, as with DNA and myself, it's disabled people giving these talks, giving these workshops and giving these and creating these resources. So it's disabled led as well. So you get up to date information. Um, there's nothing I personally dislike more than uh, than you know, HR teams or digital web design teams that don't hire any disabled people telling other organizations how they should be better inclusive. Um, yes, it's a personal pet peeve of mine. But if you have any more questions about that, um, check out my Twitter as well, uh, or message me on Twitter, or those sorts of things, um, and I'll put my email in as well. Oh, that's in the waiting room, um, where, uh, as part of my work with diversity and ability, I am, am the go-to person for you know individual advice, like should I use a PDF, or we want to put out this tweet. Is this bad? You know, the five-minute questions that you just want a thumbs up for. As a final thing, um, I focused on eco-disablism today, but a lot of you are students, 50%. I think 25% said that you were general public and 25% said that you were staff. This is a public, publicly available article, so the general public can access this, students can access this, and university staff can now access this. You may have read it already because it was out for a couple of months uh, via the subscription service that they have. But the Institute of Environmental Sciences got me to write an article on the value of disabled people inclusion within environmental sciences. So if you wanted a more specific look at like the institutional uh, pedagogical inclusion aspects of environmental science and disability, um, there's this article that covers it quite well. There's also an economic case for inclusion, um, not just the moral inclusivity aspect, but there's a very good economic argument to be made that it's just a better good practice is inclusive practice and inclusive practice is good practice um and it's publicly available free to get um and yeah i'm, I'm, I'm thankful to the environmental sciences the institute of environmental sciences for letting me write it but it allows you to get a more specific look at the assistive technology side the digital accessibility side with embedding it into your curriculum embedding it into your lectures for the staff and for the general public it's a nice little fun read if you've got some time. But thank you so much. Um, if there aren't any more questions, I'm just going to mute myself and cough. Well, thank you very much, Piers, for that absolutely amazing talk. I am sure we've all learned something. Uh, I also want to thank um, Joe Hustle and Ella Hornbury, who have uh, 
done all the behind the scenes bits and uh, organized this and also give him his money. So thanks for money. Um, so thank you very much. If you have any more questions, Piers has put his, uh, uh, their email into the chat. And also I will be putting our email in if you have any more university related things. Um, and Piers, do you mind putting the article in there as well? I'm just not having to go look for it. I also just want to say uh, thank you so much to the University of York Sustainability Team for, um, for, for allowing me to do this, as well as also following what I preach, which is uh, paying disabled people for their time. So I, not only do I thank you for the space to do this, but also the, the financial budget to support the work that we do at DNA. It's, it's you know, it's, it's factors like these that allow us to go and use those, that to deliver student focus workshops with people that can't afford uh, similar costings and who are small minor groups of maybe 10 people with no budgeting community activists because it's not just large institutions that can work sustainably and in a inclusive disabled way but we reinvest those into supporting um, smaller organizations uh, small startups disabled student groups and uh, disabled students part of our money goes straight towards supporting disabled students in education to stay in education so thank you so much.